Happy holidays, Feisty listeners. It's Sarah Gross here, founder and CEO of Feisty Media. And I want to personally wish all of you a happy holidays and most importantly, thank you for tuning in to one or more of our feisty podcasts this year. Whether you're about to listen to Girls Gone Gravel, All Bodies on Bikes, If We Were Riding, Iron Women, The Business of Fitness, or my very own Women's Performance Podcast, I know you're interested in improving your fitness and overall health in 2024. And so I wanted to share a fantastic holiday opportunity with you. At Feisty, we take our partnerships very seriously, and by that I mean we don't simply accept any brand willing to pay for ads. We have said no to many brands on multiple occasions. We vet our partners by trying the products and diving into the science behind them. In that vein, I wanted to jump in here and tell you about our new favorite wearable technology, a company that is investing in women's health, the Aura Ring. Aura aims to be the leading women's wearable with features like Cycle Insights that help you know your body better. Aura partners with leaders in women's health so that no matter where you're tracking, Aura can be the one tool that ensures your data is always up to date and accurate. With automatically sensed temperature trend data to better track your cycle, Aura offers unparalleled accuracy with all-day wearability and a seven-day battery life. With personalized insights about sleep, activity, and stress, Aura gives you better control of your overall health because all health is women's health. I've personally been loving my Aura ring and have made some adjustments, improved my sleep, and how I feel day in, day out since I started using it. Get 10% off an Aura ring at AuraRing.com forward slash feisty. 10% off is a great deal. We will throw that link into the show notes for you so you can link directly from there. Support Feisty and also benefit from this discount from our vetted partner. Thank you once again for listening and I wish you all the best for 2024. Welcome to All Bodies on Bikes, the podcast, where all bodies are good bodies, all bikes are good bikes, and all rides should be celebrated. All Bodies on Bikes is a movement to create and foster a size-inclusive bike community. So join your hosts. I'm Maggie. And I'm Marley. As we explore the complexities of the biking world, help us break down barriers and create the world that we want to see. And don't forget that all bodies really means all bodies, not just larger bodies but bodies of all sizes, ages, races, abilities, genders, sexualities, and beyond. Come along for the ride. Hi friends, this is Marley Blonsky, one of your hosts of the podcast. And before today's episode, I just have something um, short to say to all of you. Um, We were contacted by a listener who made an incredibly valid point. um, And it's just something that I want to talk about before we get into today's episode. Um, In our introduction episode, we asked that you call us in, that we talk about the hard things. And when we mess up, that you take us to task. And one of our dear listeners did just that. And for that, I am super, super grateful. Um, This person wrote to us and said in our last episode, um, we used some exclusionary language, especially to transgender and non-binary folks. Um, I'm not going to repeat that language. It it wasn't a slur, um, but suffice it to say that we can do better And we will do better going forward, especially when talking about um, men and women and females. And we just need to be more specific. You know, if we're talking about people with vaginas um, having saddle pain, we should say that. Um, Because as you all know, we can't assume anybody's gender based on what's in their pants, nor should it matter to us. It's none of our business. Um, And so I'm just really grateful to this listener for uh, writing to us and letting us know that we need to have more inclusive language and we need to do better. And I would invite all of you to do the same. So if you do ever do hear us say something that you want us to be better at, or think maybe we could do better on a topic, please write to us. Let us know podcast at allbodiesonbikes.com. This is intended to be a space for us all to learn and to do better. 
And I am really grateful to be in this space with all of you. Um, So we will do our best to do better. And I hope you enjoy today's episode. Hi, Maggie. Hey, Marley. How are you doing today? I'm swelling yourself. I'm good. I'm tired. I just got back from a road trip. Um, Yeah. How was Texas? It was good. I drove to Austin. I didn't realize it was nine hours each way. (laughs) Um, So I might've spent more time driving than I did on the ground. Yeah. But that's okay. Um, Got to go for a gravel ride with Abby Robbins, who's going to be a guest um, next week on our podcast. Oh yeah. Um, And then we did a group ride, which was my first group ride of the year. So that was a lot of fun. Nice. How was your weekend? Um, It was good. What did I do? Uh, I went and saw my best friends in the whole wide world last night and like had set aside time. I was going to get there at five. I was going to leave at like eight. Uh, they put the kids down, I think around eight and I finally left their house at 1130. <laughs> oh my gosh. Those are the best visits when you can, it just, was like, so awesome. Be fully present and you lose track of time. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, let's talk about our guest for today. Let's do it. Who do we have on today? Um, we have on just a really spectacular human person. Her name is Yasmin Boachi. Um, she is a Ghanaian American cyclist, triathlete, and all around badass from the Maryland suburbs of DC. Uh, we met her, I, I guess you as well. I'm speaking for you, Marley, um, <laughs> because she was a member of last year's SBT gravel cohort. Uh, and she fell in love with gravel cycling through that and has since raced the DC area group melanin base miles. She's, she's ridden with them and ridden from New York to DC as a member of the second annual 1928 legacy tour. She's currently a member of the great USA multi-sport development team. She's doing just a little bit of everything, you know, just all the stuff. Uh, and she loves vegan pastries, samoids, and creating space for greater inclusion and equity in the amateur sporting world. Dang. Welcome to the show, Yasmin. Woo. <laughs> Thank you. I'm so excited to be here. That was like the best introduction ever. Well, you wrote it. So <laughs> exactly. You know, great minds, great minds. But Maggie's voice reading aloud just brought everything to life. I feel so special. Right. I want Maggie to narrate my life. Oh my God. And there goes Marley. <laughs> we don't know what she's doing. Uh... <laughs> oh well, man. I feel like, I feel a TikTok uh, series coming on. Oh my gosh. Yes, please. Just me narrating things. Yes, definitely. Um, Well, Yasmin, you've got so many awesome things going on and I'm looking at your bio and there's like a couple of things that just pop out to me immediately that I want to ask about. Um, First of all, happy Black History Month. (laughs) Thank you. It is a great month to be a Black person in America. (laughs) It is. It's, I mean, I'm obviously not a Black person, but to hear stories, (laughs) to learn history, um, I just started watching the 1619 Project and I'm just like, having my mind blown. And I wish that we were having so many more of these conversations. So really grateful to you for taking time out to talk with us. And um, can you tell us a little bit about the 1928 legacy tour oh my this gosh. on the question list, but I want to know about it. Yeah. It's so funny. So I don't know if you knew this Marley, but like, so I was on the, as Maggie mentioned, I was on the SBT gravel team and that was the first it was that very first meeting when we we're all like getting to know each other. I don't remember what time of year this was anymore. Time has like flown. <laughs> it did. Um, but I remember there were, I think like at least 15 or 16 of us on the call. And I was like trying to match like stories to names to faces on Zoom. And I remember um, Daniela was introducing herself and she's a fellow cyclist, woman of color from, she was in the DC area at the time. And so I was like, oh, I need to figure out how to connect with her. Like we're in the same area, we're all over the country. And then she mentioned offhand that she had done this thing called the 1928 Legacy Tour the year before. And it was a ride from New York to DC, honoring um, the story of five black women who did that ride in 1928. And so I have to admit at that moment, everyone else was still introducing themselves, but I was like on Google, like, wait, what is this tour? This is amazing, yeah. like who put this together? Um, and there's a local woman in the DC area named Keisha Robertson, and she basically researched the history of this tour that these women did over three days. Um, there were five of them, they were friends, and they just decided like for the joy of riding that they wanted to ride from New York to DC. And just thinking about the fact that like without GPS, without navigation, without safe haven, like without cool new bikes, with lots of gearing, um, without spandex, like they (laughs) 
did this ride um, and there was just something, it was already a big leap for me. Um, and I'm sure we'll talk more about this, but to even think about riding at SBT Gravel. Mm -hmm. um, at the time I had never ridden more than 50 miles before. And even that was a big thing. And so I was already like stretching my brain out into like, maybe I'll do a century at SBT Gravel in eight months. And then as soon as I heard the 1928 Legacy Tour, I was like, guess I'm doing two big things next year because I need to figure out how to be a part of this. So it's funny to, to start off with that because the reason I even know about that tour was because of the community that you created. So oh, that's so cool. So it was a, it was a bike tour from New York to DC. Mm -hmm. um, how many folks were on it with you? So last year it was seven women were on the, the team. Um, and in fact, this year, I just went to the first meeting of the women who are doing it this year. I think there's going to be like 13 of them. So it's slowly but surely growing um, yeah. all over the country, which is really exciting. Oh my gosh. I have goosebumps just hearing you talk about it. That's amazing. Awesome. That's so incredibly cool. Um, I was recently, I learned about the um, bicycle corp, uh, corpsmen in the, I think it was World War II. Um, scouting out routes and just the the really badass things that people, I mean, still do on bikes, but used to do, like you said, without any of the modern equipment or cell phones or GPS or, you know, tubeless tires. Uh, <laughs> right. <laughs> there's so many things we take for granted now. Yeah. So are you working as a mentor for next year's team? I am. Yeah. That was something that um, the Keisha decided, you know, there's something very doable, but also very terrifying about doing a three-day tour because it was touring pace so it was not like a race where there's all this sort of pressure and anxiety that comes from racing um but there was still like even for people who have done centuries there's still a fear of like okay I know I can do a century but can I do another one the next day and then ride more the next day um and so for pretty much anyone who does it regardless of their cycling background it's a step up in effort and training um and seeing what you can do on a bike and so Keisha wanted to make sure that the woman this year had mentors support who could talk about what it feels like to go from like noodling around on your bike in your hometown to doing this huge ride over three days. So it's really exciting to get to support them in that way. That's so fantastic. You're going to be really good at that. <laughs> Thank you. You're going to be really good at that. Well, so that's kind of where we're at now. What, how did you get into cycling? What's your, what's your biking background? Yeah. So I was never like, I always had a bike in college. I was like the person who's like buy a bike from target and then leave it in a ditch and get it stolen. <laughs> like sure. I was like had bikes around, but was never very serious. Never even knew to be honest, but I'm sure many people like this besides tour de France. I never knew there was anything else besides casual writing and then like professional writing. Yeah. Um, and my entry point was triathlon. So my dad and I used to run together in high school. And I remembered he told me at one point, like, I always really wanted to do an Ironman. And I was like, what is an Ironman? And he explained it to me. I'm like, that sounds very hard. Um, but he never learned to swim. Neither of my parents were swimmers. And so it was really important to them that growing up um, that we learned to swim. And so both my sister and I are slow swimmers, but we know how to do it. And so it was one of those things where like, I had this thought of, I know how to swim. I know how to ride. I know how to run. I'm not particularly amazing at all three, but I can try. Um, and so during the pandemic, we all had a lot of free time. There were bikes floating around. And so I was like, let me just try out like designing my own triathlon, which is one of many bad ideas I'm sure <laughs> uh, today. Um, but yeah, that's how I ended up. Like I, my dad actually had won a bike from his job, like an old mountain, random mountain bike that had been in nice. the garage kind of resting away. So I borrowed that from him. I started um, at the time I was dating someone who was a bike commuter. And so I started like trying to ride around Baltimore, just like figuring out gears and hills and all the things. Um, and then in 2020, I ended up doing that like self-designed track line. So I ended up like swimming at a pool and then riding my bike from like the border of Baltimore down into the Inner Harbor. And then I ran in circles around the Inner Harbor to do my own little like sprint triathlon. I and love that, that so like, much. Into, yeah, into cycling. Yeah, that's fantastic. I love the design your own thing. Have you done more formal triathlons since the design? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. After, after that, I was like, I guess this like wasn't too bad. Um, and it'd probably be better to like 
not be riding through random areas on a Strava map that <laughs> I designed poorly and like never tried out until the day of this race that I made up. Um, so yeah, so after that, I got very involved. One of the huge privileges I see um, and opportunities in triathlon as a, like overall, there's still like a lot of problematic things in the sport in terms of inclusion, especially the history there. But in terms of efforts, um, one thing that really connected me to triathlon was the fact that there is a category for women who weigh over 165 pounds called Athena. Um, and I just thought that was really cool. Like, I was like, wow, there's like a special category for women who are not in these sort of stereotypical bodies in triathlon. And I ended up connecting with a coach who exclusively coaches Athena triathletes and had a team um, called Team Go Big. Her name's Kyla Lupo. She's an amazing human being. Um, but she was doing this work in creating space for women in triathlon. And so once I had kind of designed and done my own thing, I reached out to her to see about competing um, at, a, at a real try. And so with her coaching and support, I ended up doing my first actual try in Chattanooga. Um, and I chose that one because it was the Athena National Championships. So, so that cool. was like, yeah, that was like the dopest thing to like not <laughs> only be doing my first try in like a really cool town. Um, but also around people of different, bo like it, the body types compared to your average try were just so much more inclusive and not just the fact that we, um, it was our national championship meant that we got to race first. And so mm. we the first ones in the water and like, there's so much support and you're crossing the finish line and my coach was there. So it was such an amazing, like, I wish that for every person and try that they would have their first one be super inclusive because Many of them are not, um, but it gave me the confidence to show up at other tries and be proud of myself and my abilities um, as I continue to compete overall. I love that. I'm, I'm not going to lie. I almost signed up for a triathlon a couple of years ago. Um, there was a Dan Skin women's triathlon, I think in Seattle, and I got super intimidated uh, mainly by the clothing because I was just yeah. like, do you wear the same thing for all three? Am I trying to like put a wet sports bra on? Like, and I, I didn't figure it out. <laughs> Can yeah. you explain this to me? How does those are so such a problem? Um, <laughs> so yeah, this was, and this was part of the joy of being on Kyla's team was like, we had weekly team meetings and she would run through topics. Like the nutrition is also a big, scary thing, uh, for a triathlon, like transition. How do you get off a bike and run when you were just biking and you don't want to run anymore yeah like are you running uh, in a chamois um so triathlon suits they have a really thin chamois so it's meant to not hold water so I would say it's like a third of the thickness of a, a regular chamois hmm. um and then my big thing was like boobs where do they go this yeah. suit doesn't have anything going on so I did not realize until connecting with other women like most women wear a sports bra under their tri suit, or like I'm sure some people who have less issues with booby jiggling <laughs> things, like they <laughs> don't, but most of us do. Um, and so a lot of these materials like actually will dry out pretty well on the bike, like the airflow kind yeah. of gets dry, especially if the weather is good. And then by the time you're running, you're pretty much dry, which I was surprised by because I was just like, there's no way I'm getting out of water. And like not toweling off. And then you do towel off like a little bit during transition and in longer races. Another thing I didn't know was some people will literally just change all their clothes. Like I thought you had to wear the same thing. Yeah, the same. Whole, right. Yeah. And then I was like, there's actually bathrooms and like changing tents at Iron Man's where you can just do a full like people even put like lipstick on in the middle of the race. People do all kinds of things. Heck yeah. I love These it. Are all the it's that I, yeah, I had no idea until I started connecting, particularly with women um, who talked more intimately about these things. I think similarly, kind of on the gravel side, like our, our steamboat meetings last year, um, it's one of those things where if you've never done a long distance event of any type, you don't even know what questions to ask. Yes. Um, so I would love to talk to you about, you know, what drew you to apply for the steamboat gravel team and to make the switch from triathlon to gravel or to, to cycling and was it a switch do you still do both yeah a uh, great question <laughs> oh I do still do both um I'm sure I've told you this before but like I still am baffled by the fact so I saw the post that you did on Instagram like apply for this team I did not even know what gravel meant 
like I didn't know like <laughs> I'm so I come from I'm from Maryland from the suburbs um I've always lived in cities for the most part so I didn't even know gravel roads were a thing I didn't know what a farm road was I just <laughs> was like oh my god all bodies on bikes that's all my brain could respond to and yeah. I was like, SBT gravel whatever that means like I want to ride with these people um so I remember recording the video I was just like yeah I think you had asked like do you have a gravel bike I was like no, but like, you know, I'll find a bike. I know how to find bikes. <laughs> like, <I'll be> <laughs> um, best thing about it was the time frame Cause I think we applied in like either October or November and mm-hmm. it wasn't until August. So my brain instantly went to like, we've got tons of time to figure this shit out. Like we're just going to go for it. Um, so as soon when I got on the team, when I was like, okay, I need to figure out what is gravel. Uh, where, yes. where do I ride this gravel? What, like, what kind of bike can I use to get on gravel? Like it was like, okay, this is time to determine what this actually means. Um, and that's kind of funnily enough, what led me to Melanin Base Smile. Cause I was like, I'm going to have to find some gravel in this area and being in a city, I'm sure y'all can identify this in different types of ways, but like if you're in a city, you probably have to go somewhere else to go find gravel. And that's really intimidating. And Mm -hmm. one of the things that melanin base models works to rectify is the fact that if you're going to like certain parts of Virginia or certain parts of Maryland, you don't want to go by yourself and ride these maybe private, maybe restricted farm roads, be out there with like no technology and not know what you're doing and ride, you know, it's Road riding has its own issues of safety, but I think sometimes with gravel, there is what I've noticed now that I've gotten more into it is there tends to be an assumption like gravel is just the safer thing. It's so much easier. It's so much better. And it is fun, (laughs) but you want to feel, especially as a person of color, you want to feel like you're safe when you're going to places where historically people of color have not been invited to. Yeah. Um, Yeah. So that was, yeah, a long story about how I got into gravel, but it's been a joy to figure out what it is and to <laughs> enjoy the process of getting to know like the local gravel scene in now Maryland and Northern Virginia. So there is a gravel scene. You can, you can get to some, do you have to drive a ways? Yeah, it's a ways. Um, so with Melon and Base Miles there, most of those folks are based in either Richmond or DC. And so we would go to Loudoun County, which is very well known for their awesome gravel that would take about depending on where you're coming from like 45 minutes to an hour an hour and a half we would be traveling just to ride um so it would really turn into like all day event there's no gravel within cycling just like you know you have to cycle like 30 40 miles to just get to a trail yeah and that's enough of a ride on its own oh my gosh yeah I'm like (laughs) I want to come back from that (laughs) it does not sound fun at all (laughs) Um, I want to go back just a couple of minutes and really acknowledge what you said about, um, you know, a lot of folks just off the bat say, oh, gravel's safer because there's no cars. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm guilty of that myself. And it really is coming from a place of privilege where um, I'm not questioned when I'm out there or I don't question my my inherent safety. Um, I mean, I do sometimes because sometimes I present as queer or more queer than others or whatever it might be. Um, but that's a really valid point. And I think we should all um, just take it in and realize that, you know, your experience on gravel is not the same as somebody else's. Um, and just keeping that in mind when you maybe invite friends to go for a ride, uh, are they going to feel safe there? Yeah. I mean, that's huge. I think, um, I've gone on some rides with like all at this point, I'm, I have expanded my cycling community. It's very diverse. I really enjoy the folks that I ride with, but there are some folks who are a little bit more willing maybe to like take a risk, right. When a sign says like, this is private farmland, um, I personally don't want to be caught on someone's land that I don't know who they, and you know, that's not something that I know there's people who have varying degrees of fear, regardless of what your identity is because of whatever past experiences you've had. But I would just say that, especially thinking about private land, the fact that you're on a bike, the fact that the service might not be good. Those are all components of what makes someone feel safe or less safe on a bike. Um, and so I think, especially as gravel is working to be more expansive and inclusive, I would just be interested to keep seeing narratives around like what is the larger community doing to make sure everyone who shows up on those rides feels safe and protected and confident when they're out there. Definitely. Um, and you, you talked a little bit about melanin based miles, but can we back up? Um, yeah. What is melanin based miles? How, yeah. if somebody's curious, how do they find out more? What is it? Yeah. So melanin based miles is amazing. Um, there's a woman named Sheila who's based in the DC area. She founded this group to basically 
break barriers when it came to grapple. She got into it. Um, I think it started in 2020, maybe 2019, and wanted to open up that space for cyclists to identify as people of color to be able to go to different events and rides and feel comfortable. And so last year I applied to be on their scholarship program, which basically provided entry into a local gravel race here on the East Coast. And then they did these wonderful training rides where they also taught us like, what is gravel? Um, how do you yeah. ride? Like, again, I did not know um, phrases like off camber. I honestly still don't really for real know what that means. Like, I don't either. It's okay. Uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> I have no you. idea. I feel so seen right now. Um, <laughs> but these are things like even when you would listen to a beginner podcast of like, you know, oh, we're just going to talk casually about bikes. I, I've just found that the um, like getting from zero to one with bikes is really hard. Like yeah. even just trying to get people to explain to me like how to change my gears or like how to descend better. There's just a, a barrier at times. That, and sometimes I'm, I don't know um, what can be done to cross that or to make things a little bit more beginner friendly, but they really helped me in terms of like people on the group ride actually give me tips and advice from a place of positivity. And I think that's what I love about it the most is it's a group of people that have sort of defined the safe space on a bike for you to be a true beginner and to be honest about what's hard for you, um, which can be very different than a group ride where you're the new person and you're trying to figure out the vibes and people are commenting, but maybe not from a place of like teaching more of a place of mansplaining. Yo, um, what's your tire pressure? Yeah, <laughs> just like mind your business. I'm <laughs> That's a shirt. That's a shirt. <laughs> yeah. Mind your business. <laughs> yes. Around my tire brush. Yeah, um, exactly. Oh. But yeah, so it's it's just um the goal is is again to create that inclusivity. Um and finally enough, I think this will be the first maybe melanin based miles slash all buddies on bike connect because we're all gonna be at mid-south um in a couple weeks, which is really exciting. So yes. Um, I got the chance to meet she Sheila at um, Rooted Vermont, and you're right. She really is just a powerhouse, and you know she saw the need and said, "I'm going to do something about this." And um, I think if more folks did that, it would go a long ways. Yes. Yeah. Um, what distance are you riding at Mid South? So I'm signed up for the hundred. Um, I am just hoping they posted something a couple of days ago, like weather looks great. I was like keep it that way. I don't yeah. need the weather to change for the next one month because I feel like that distance, um, and it's, again, it's amazing to say this because a year ago I had not even ridden a hundred miles before ever. Um, but somehow that distance has become doable for me, but what's not doable is mechanicals, uh, mud, rain, <laughs> snow, <laughs> any inclement <laughs> weather. So I'm fingers crossed that that'll be a good experience somehow. Yes. Well, I'm just thinking like to give a, to give an even more well-rounded view of you as a person and an athlete, can you share with everybody how you did SBT last year? Because that's <laughs> one of my favorite things that happened while we were in Colorado. <laughs> yeah. So SBT, you guys have to remind me, um, there's like a 37, yeah, 64, 64, I think. Yes. And then 100 and 144. So we had a lot of options, um, yeah. which is really cool. I, I would say um, I had not seen that at a race before. Like with triathlon, you usually pick these very different distances and things like that. So that was like really awesome to have choices. But as I mentioned, because I had never ridden gravel at the time, I was like, I don't know what this is going to feel like. Um, and then on top of that, I also had never ridden at elevation. So I had a lot of anxious moments in the zoom calls with y'all where I was like, <laughs> I want to do a hundred, but I don't know if I can do a hundred, <laughs> a lot of drama around that. Um, so I ended up signing up for the 64, but I knew in my heart of hearts, I wanted to do the century. And so there was, um, the, the way they designed the courses is also really cool because they all kind of loop together yeah. in different ways. And so I was on the um, path doing the 64 and I was like feeling good. And it was a nice day. All of my beautiful humans from Zoom were in my real life and we were <laughs> feeling the warm feelings, like the oh, vibe yeah. was so good. And I was just, I saw the split for like the 100 and the 64. And I was like, are you really going to do this? And I was like, 
yeah, I think I'm just gonna go do this. And I had not prepared anything. Like I, <laughs> I had the fitness, which was great in terms of just, I had been writing a lot to, to practice, but in terms of like mental preparation to write a novel <laughs> that day, it was not there, but um, it was awesome. I ended up connecting with um, another team that was there it was the Ride for Racial Justice team. And we yeah. had kind of like casually interacted with them, but there was a woman on that team who I ended up catching up to. And at one of the um, rest stops, she was like, you want to ride the rest of this together? And I would never have been brave enough to act. Like it was one of those moments where I was like, oh my gosh, I can't believe she just asked me that. <laughs> like I feel so seen. Um, and I was like, yeah, girl, let's ride. And so it just ended up being such, I mean, to be representing all bodies on bikes and like riding to the finish line with someone from Ride for Racial Justice and just feeling like seen, like all the identities, all the things, all the goodness, all the space opened up. It was such a magical day. I don't think I realized that was your first century that day. So it wasn't my first century, but okay. it was the first gravel of any disc. Like, I don't think I had ridden more than like 40 miles of gravel <laughs> and definitely the most elevation. I mean, oh, for sure. that's amazing. <laughs> I hope you're still like feeling the glory of that because I remember hearing that I, I finished and funny enough, I had similar experience. I met up with Alicia from ride for racial justice and we rode together and it really was powerful to be riding together. Um, but I remember coming across and somebody told me, yeah, Yasmin, I think is doing the hundred. I was like, what? Yeah. <laughs> and then you came in very shortly after I did. Cause I had a hell of a day out there. Yeah. And I just remember seeing that smile on your face. Like I was like, yeah, yeah. She deserves to be proud. That's so mm -hmm. awesome. It felt so good. It was definitely one of those moments where like you really learn. I think that's something we talked about all year together, but like how to check in with your body. And I would say, even though I have been doing all these like, you know, sports, track, I had really always had a very fraught relationship with that idea of like, check in with yourself, see how you feel. It was always like power to the finish line, get this done, like very negative patriarchal concepts of <laughs> fitness that I'm always trying to undo. And so this was one of those moments where I had to genuinely check in. I'm like, am I doing, do I want to do the hundred? Because like, what's the real reason here? Mm, and it yeah. really was like, my body feels amazing. I feel so well-trained. I'm yeah. breathing air. I wasn't sure if I was going to be able to breathe up there. So <laughs> yeah. it's like, the air is okay. I'm not lightheaded. Like I'm good. So that yeah. was I think, the biggest thing was just having a genuine moment of true appreciation for like this body that I've worked so, so hard to like, train and fuel and take care of and get enough sleep and hydrate. And it was all coming together in like a really beautiful way. And you weren't even on your own bike. Yeah, I know. <laughs> oh goodness. We talked about that uh, a couple weeks ago with Greer. And I, I think that is probably still one of her favorite stories from oh. Steamboat Gravel to just be able to, um, you know, relieve the stress. Cause it was like, oh my God, I just, you know, been training all year for this thing. And then my bike didn't show up. What do I do? Yeah. Um, so just the power of community. Yeah. And that was one of those moments too, where it's like, I tell people this every time I tell that story, but it was, what was meaningful is like, we had Greer's like personal phone number and she answered the phone. And for me to like be having this freak out moment, but know who to contact. I just, I, you know, I try not to shade Iron Man too much, but they're problematic. But like, if I showed up at an Iron Man and my bike wasn't there, it would a hundred percent be like, you're just shit out of luck. There's 2,000 other people yeah. here. Who are you? And SBT had just as many people as an Ironman would. But what was there was like a clear, direct line to support. And even if she hadn't been able to come through in such a personal way, I also knew I had like 20 people on the ground who would do anything to help me. And like Bernie was like, I know the specialized reps here. Like, I'm going <laughs> to them and see if you can borrow a demo. There's no reason you shouldn't have a bike at this bike event <laughs> like it's a bike place um so that was I to me what took it over the top and again just the feeling I've just never felt as included at anything um as I feel like I did on that day oh I love it and that just warms my heart because that was the goal with it um and you you put these intentions out into the world and you work towards it but you never know what's actually going to happen on the day of so I'm really really grateful um that kind of leads me to my next question. And sorry, Maggie, I'm talking a lot because I always do. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> what, 
what advice would you give to other women or just people from underrepresented communities who want to get into triathlon or gravel or whatever activity of choice it might be? Yeah, I would definitely say one, there are a lot of spaces out there. I think, um, like between meetup and Facebook and Instagram, like there's so much happening. Um, one of the things I would say that I don't think I initially realized is like even Instagram, I always felt like, oh, that person's, you know, has thousands of followers. I can't talk to them. And then I realized like, these are just regular people. And even if they don't respond, that's like, I have that ability to reach out. That's part of why they're putting themselves out there. Um, so a great example of that is like when I did my first half Ironman, um, it happened to be the debut race of Sika Henry, who's the first black female professional triathlete ever. Um, and this was in 2021. So we've never had in the history oh, of the sport. That's of wild. Women, right. I'm like, what, what is going on here? But that said, um, she, so we did the same for, and it was amazing. Cause I'm like, oh my God, she's doing her first race. I'm doing my first race. Like this is incredible. Um, and so I, I don't, or I haven't told this story, but the first time I attempted that distance, I actually had a bike mechanical basically at the very end of the bike ride. So it was like a 56 mile ride. And at mile 50, my bike was like oh. fell apart and I could not finish. Oh. Um, and that really sucked. And so I ended up sort of processing that and um, writing about it on Instagram. And I tagged Seek and I was like, you know, despite this being a rough day for me, I ended up like being really excited to see, like be there during Sika's first race. And she replied and I was like, oh my goodness, like a professional athlete of mine replied to me. Um, so it's all a long way of saying that I did not realize how, like now I know people who know her personally and like how small, especially for women of color, these communities are, but also that smallness as even though it can be sometimes sad to be like one of just a few at a race, that also means that there's a lot of connection and connectivity between those folks to be found. Um, and I think that just, I'm, I'm sure y'all can speak to just generally, like there's all these different intersecting identities where you can actually access people For um, sure. who are similar to you, but maybe seem like miles apart or feel like they're a lot more advanced, but end up being great resources. So that's a long way of saying that even though it can feel a little bit disconnected to be a minority in the sport, you are super connected through all these different avenues to feel supported, even if that support is coming from someone very different than you. Yeah, definitely. Oh, I love that. Um, is Did Sika have a good result at that triathlon? Do you remember? She also had a run race. So oh, no. that was another bonding experience. I think um, I won't like put words in her, but I know she posted about it. And it was just like, really, really challenging. And she has an amazing story as well, where she had come back from significant injury mm -hmm. to be able to show up at that start line. And so there was, again, just a lot of beauty in seeing like, she's very, very honest about how difficult the journey has been for her in terms of like support and feeling like she's supposed to be there when it comes to lining up, but also feeling the weight of that representation. So again, at very different levels, it was really beautiful to feel like there was some similarity in our stories there. For sure. Um, one of our, the other podcasts on the Feisty Media Network is a triathlon podcast. Um, and I know all the podcasts are trying to do stuff to honor Black History Month. So I'll have to pass on her name um, yeah. and get her, we'll definitely link to her in the, in the show notes. Um, I guess we've, we've kind of dug into this a little bit, but going back a little bit, um, you know, obviously being part of an affinity community is fun and it makes you feel like you're welcome. Um, you know, why else does it matter? Why else is it important? Yeah, I just think um, one of the things that doesn't get always talked about is sometimes there's this idea that making space in a community for individuals is all about like giving them resources like, oh, we'll, you know, bring all bodies on bikes to SBT or we'll bring ride for racial and we'll give them resources to be there. But the other side of that is also showing the, what I like to call like the dominant folks in the sport, whatever dominant means in that particular space, that we are just as equipped to be there and we are there for our own reasons and those reasons matter. And if we're just keeping it real, especially with like cycling and triathlon, which aren't the most um, thriving sports <laughs> in the world, it's actually really important that those are made more inclusive for like the future of the sport. 
And I think um, I, it's easier for me to speak to triathlon because I have a little bit more understanding of like the larger framework there, but it's a sport that like has had a really high peak in like the nineties and two thousands and has like really struggled to maintain popularity compared to like things like gravel and um, trail running, like that are becoming, I think more intentionally inclusive. I think triathlon has struggled because it's always been a sort of like gross sport for rich people. Um, and now it's like, wait, we need more than rich bros to support this sport. What are we going to do? Um, and finally, I think road cycling seems to be going through some of that too. Um, so it's all a long way of saying, I think that it, it's important because I think folks who people need to know that it's not just about like having inclusion for inclusion's sake. There's also very much the ability for folks who are outside of the traditional norms of these sports to help make the sports more vibrant, sustainable, possible for you to keep doing this. Um, so that's just my big push for like, you know, when you see folks who look different from you at the start line, it's not, I just, I'm always wanting race directors to be mindful that they need to educate that main population of why folks deserve to be there, why their participation is valuable. And it's not just to have some token individuals, but to expand the sport as a whole. I have another like maybe dumb question about triathlon, um, about equipment. So I ride bikes a lot. I know you need a bike, um, for triathlon. Is it as simple as like swimsuit shoes and a bike? Yes. Um, it can be. So I always give the caveat of, um, it depends on the race. There are some races that like, I would imagine the women's triathlon would be a great place to, to start um, here in Baltimore, like the Baltimore try. It's actually sponsored by not a multi-sport group, but a running company. And I've just noticed that every triathlon has its own culture. Mm. So there are some cultures uh, where you'll find people have all the gear and all the things, and it feels very intimidating. And then there's other cultures where folks are on mountain bikes and they're just like, I've seen women ride the entire thing in a one piece, like on their bike in a one piece. My um, down there hurts just thinking about that, but <laughs> they got it done. Um, and then like literally running, like just throwing on some shorts and running. So I think the it's not a myth that triathlon requires a lot of gear because just still sheerly compared to like just running or just cycling or just swimming, it is more gear. And I think sometimes people try to downplay that it's like super accessible. It's definitely not, yeah. um, but it's, I think it is more accessible than the mainstream culture around it would have you think that it, it has to be. Yeah. That's reassuring. Um, I'm tempted to be like, I'm going to put a triathlon on my goals for this year, but I'm not. Um, <laughs> <laughs> maybe is a dual athlon is like two of the three an option. I was just going to ask, okay, now I have to like step into my triathlete shoes, but yes, please. you know, like, so I guess, do you like two of the three? Like you obviously like bikes. Do you like swimming or running? I grew up as a competitive swimmer. Um, yeah. so I love swimming. Um, running is a really big challenge for me. Um, so through running, you can do an aquathlon or aqua bike. Wait, no, aquathlon is the one with running. Aqua bike is the one where you just swim and then you bike and then it's over. That and sounds it's- great. So, so you should totally do an aqua bike. Yeah. I kind of already do that on social rides where it's like, Hey, we're going to the swimming hole. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. The, the one I want to do that's near me is a kayak, flat water kayak. Yes mountain bike and then a trail run yes wait that's where is the one that um that's at the u.s national whitewater center oh because there's one just like that that's in like super super southern virginia so i was like wait is that right yeah but yeah those sound really cool too yeah, exactly to figure out how to kayak like not just for fun but like to right get somewhere specific that's the part i would see like. that's my my thing with the swimming is i am the best at not drowning at moving <laughs> forward with any momentum, I am I'm not there. I don't have that. I can um, teach you. Awesome. That okay. is All me right. too, which is why I do the river. I like track onto the river swim because yeah. the river tells you where to go. You don't have to. I know there's all these hacks, y'all. You can find any race that will work for you based on your strengths, which is something. I mean, we do that in cycling too, but for I sure. like that about triathlon. And I think that's another hidden fact is that it's all like swimming in the ocean like the rivers rivers are not the cleanest but they do get you where you need to go 
kind of nice. That's like a, a game changer for me in my head. I could swim downstream in a river. Yes. I have where I wanted to go. done um, for the 70.3 distance. I only choose the ones with downstream swims and people <laughs> who are great swimmers are like scoff. Like you don't want to swim in the Atlantic ocean. I'm like, no, I don't want to swim in the Atlantic ocean. I have no interest in getting lost at sea. Yeah. And no, so. I think like common sense in endurance sports is really underrated. <laughs> right. Cause it's like what we you know what we're talking about earlier with going out into like remote places. Like I will look into the area I'm going to and be like, there's a place near me that's really good gravel, but it's, it's legitimately a cowboy town in the middle of North Carolina. <laughs> and I was going to go ride there one day. And I was like, you know what? I think I'm just going to go at like three o'clock in the morning. And the little voice in the back of my head was like, you're going to be around cowboys on a bicycle on a gravel road at three o'clock in the morning. And I was like, nope, that's a good point. Thanks for bringing that up. Yes. <laughs> there's like, so there's nothing people. wrong with doing a downstream <laughs> swim. I'm just smarter than you because you didn't think of it. <laughs> right. That was like me. I went on a group ride yesterday and the, this, my dumb thing was I did like a long trail race. And the next day I'm like, I need to go on a group ride because I'm in a bike internet competition and we need to take a ride. Like just bad ideas on bikes. <laughs> <laughs> But, um, it was super hilly and I didn't look at the elevation profile, which is my like fatal flaw in life is going mm-hmm. on rides and not looking at the elevation. Be like, oh, I'll figure it out. And like 25 miles in, we stopped at a farm store and everyone, I was like bonking hard. Everyone's being super nice to me. Like you just need treats. You just need sugar. I'm like, no, I need my sister to come pick me up. <laughs> like, let me just keep it real with y'all. And that's, that was like a crowning joy moment for me. Cause I'm like, I made a bad decision. I followed through with 75% of the bad decision. When I had an out of the bad decision, I left and got yeah. with my sister. And that is being an awesome cyclist too. Yes. A hundred percent. Yeah. Knowing your limit and saying, this is not bringing me joy anymore. I am done. Yes. And I think that's something that I've really learned over the, again, going back to the idea of listening to your body, but I think Something that tends to happen, I think, as you ride these longer distances, you're like, oh, wow, I'm so capable of like, I know how to ride 100 miles or I know how to ride all these miles over a day. Um, But then there's also like, I don't need to prove on every random group ride and every time I'm hanging with dude bros that I can, (laughs) I actually can just be me. And if they judge me, and of course, this group was like, super chill and super nice. And I think one big thing I realized is like, most of the time people aren't judging you. They're thinking about how their own quads hurt Mm -hmm. and how it's also hard for them. And it's not about body type. It's about a lot of other things. Um, But that's been a joy to just not always feel like every time I show up, I have to have this weight of like, I need to be strong and look a certain way and conquer the hills that I can just be myself. And it's important for me to be comfortable being all varieties of myself, even as someone who has done these super hard things. I think we could learn a lot from what you just said. Yeah. Um, so wrapping up, we have a couple questions that we ask everybody. Um, <laughs> the one that I like to ask is what does your dream day on a bike look like? Um, it involves just like, just the right elevation where it's like, you can like Yes. Kill that one hill, but then the rest is actually downhill instead of what normally happens where they tell you <laughs> the rest is downhill and it's not <laughs> to you and you get really mad. Um, so there is, again, just enough challenge, mostly downhill. Um, if we have to get chased by dogs, they are Samoyeds and they are very <laughs> friendly and floofy and yes. you like cuddle them. Um, there's a whole pack of them. And then you like round a corner and there's a vegan bakery and it's like wasting amazing smells and they have like gluten-free and nut-free options so everyone is happy mm. the ride. Mm-hmm. um and then maybe there's a swimming hole I have not tried that Marley but like oh you gotta maybe come to Arkansas I need to I'm yes. coming I will be there like are you coming for the gone graveling festival no I have other some other bike being on that same weekend, but okay. I'm getting the intention that I will come visit. Awesome. Here. And you too, Maggie, I'm going to come see you in North Heck Carolina. Heck yeah. We have good swimming holes as well. I need to figure it out because we do not have good swimming holes in Maryland. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe somewhere further from here, but in Baltimore, I'm like, ooh, toxic, toxic. <laughs> yeah. Are there good public pools that you could ride to? There is, you know, it's funny, there is one, but there's a bunch of like secret 
codes that you need to figure out. Yeah, I know there's problematic histories yeah. here, um, but yeah, I'm going to figure it out this year, how to get into that pool. But some, there are, there is like a state park that has a really nice shoreline. So to give Baltimore some credit, it is a great place to ride. I don't want to like seem like I love living here. I love running and riding here, but bodies of water are very questionable and it's good to know where that water is coming from. That is so true. Um, <laughs> another good bet is just like find a random sprinkler that's on and ah, yeah. run through it. <laughs> I haven't done that. You haven't done it I ever? had the sprinklers turned on on me on a ride. <laughs> oh my God. I had stopped to make a freaking Instagram post. This was during my fundraiser that I do every year. And I, so I had my phone out. The dude was less than 10 feet behind me. I was standing on top of one of the sprinklers and he turned them on to test them. It's like, <laughs> you couldn't just be like, hey, take one step to your left. You could be like, hey, I'm about to test the sprinklers. Nope, not at all. Oh, That's I great. hope you Thanks, got buddy. that recorded on your, for your. I cut right. Cause when I stopped talking, I was like, what does that sound? Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah, I'm like um one of the first gravel races I did it was a it was like 100 degrees I was supposed to be a 40 mile race and I was like so I'll be dropping down to the 20 mm-hmm. because mm-hmm. this is not necessary I don't need to ride all these miles um but there was this terrible like 20 percent grade hill that, I, I know I just, now I'm like why why do we do this um, I don't <laughs> But at the top of the hill, there was a girl and she had a super soaker and she's like, do you want me to spray you? And I was like, yes, <laughs> spray me. I need this so bad. So that's like the best water soaking memory I have yes. of being on a bike and very much needing to be hydrated with something more than the water in my bottle. <laughs> that sounds amazing. Um, I have a real quick follow-up on your dream day. I always forget that you're vegan because you're one of the few vegans who doesn't like I'm vegan. I'm vegan. I'm vegan. I'm vegan. <laughs> and I'm probably going to piss people off with that. But what's your favorite snack to take on a ride? On a ride? Yeah, I so I love um, untapped maple. They do like stroop waffles. And like before I was vegan, I love stroop waffles. <laughs> and I love like warming them on my coffee and have these mm-hmm. like, romantic relationships with stroop waffles. Mm-hmm. And so when I found out they weren't vegan, I was like, oh, like another thing like stolen from my grasp. Um, So I remember I was at a bike shop and they had these like little shrew waffle things. And I like, I just get in the habit of like, let me just see if this is vegan so I can be like disappointed that it's not. (laughs) Sure. (laughs) Yes. Yes, I know. Yes. Sad. Oh, no, I sport it. (laughs) (laughs) I picked it up and I was like, wait, this is vegan. Oh my God. Started crying and tears came down my face, but. Yeah, those are my favorite by far for good ride fuel. We should make Ted King listen to this and send you some uh, some vegan stroop waffles, sure, yes. untapped. Eat all of them, literally yes. <laughs> all of all of them. Um, well, and then Maggie has a really fun last question. Yeah, you are all the things you do. All the things we've discussed that multiple times throughout the uh, duration of this podcast. What is one thing you wish you got to talk about more? The more people asked you about. I think one thing I wish more people talked about or asked about was like intergenerational uh, connection in cycling. Mm -hmm. Um, And then thinking about this because of the legacy tour and one of the greatest like beauties there was the fact that there was a woman on the tour who's like by far the strongest cyclist of all like crushed us in so many ways. Um, And she's a grandmother and she was in her sixties and just hearing her experience and wisdom and that she made a very decisive choice to like get into cycling and into running like a nationally ranked do athlete in her um like as she became a grandmother and her kids were out of the house and things like that it was just amazing to be able to be connected to someone who's not I think we get so caught up in like our age group in when we're in competitions and then just socially we tend to be around people who are our own age but having that connection to someone who is in a different age category and getting to like connect about the same thing with them was really exciting so I feel like there's a lot of possibilities, especially for women cyclists to connect with each other across generations. And that's just not something that there's always like clear ways of doing that. Um, Like even in Baltimore, when I think of like the different cycling groups, like the team that I'm on now is very much like we're all in our thirties pretty much. Um, And then I see teams out there and they're women and they're like clearly in a different generation. And so that's something that I've just been thinking about or what are some like more direct ways to share that experience and create connections across those differences. Yeah. 
Oh, you've got my mind thinking now. Yeah. Well, I know that's part of like, um, all bodies on bikes. Like that's also a space for that. And I think it is not always the, maybe the primary way that we're thinking about connection, but it's, it's very much there. Like we're all in the space. So. Yeah, definitely. And because cycling, I mean, moving your body at any age feels good. Um, but as you know, your knees start to wear out or whatever, um, cycling is friendly to all ages. And then, you know, if you need to, you can get an e, or if you want to, you can get an e-bike or yeah. a tricycle or a recumbent. There's a lot of adapt adaptation adapt. Is that the word adaptations? I think so. Yeah. Changes you can make. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I think that would be a really fun thing to maybe focus on. Um, is is older cyclists or older women in general. Cause yes, you're right. There's so much wisdom to be learned. And we all think we're the first one to be heartbroken or left behind or dealing with X, Y, Z. Nope. Generations have been going through this before us. Turns out. Yeah. Um, well, Yasmin, it has been such a delight to have you on. Um, we will put your links to your social media. If you're okay with that in the show notes, um, along with some information about the legacy tour, um, some information about the Athena category, which you introduced us to. Um, and then also melanin base, not excuse me, melanin base miles. Um, where else can we find you this year? Oh my gosh. So I'll be at mid South. Super excited about that. Um, I'll be in Iceland. So if anyone's doing the West Fjords way, so and excited. planning to suffer with me, I'll, that'll be my big suffer fest of the year. And then I'm back at SBT travel with y'all again. Ooh, yay. Uh, Oh, that's that's so exciting too. So go triathlon, but go gravel more this year. (laughs) (laughs) And if people want to catch up with you on social media, where can they find you? Yeah. So I'm at, um, Yasmin, the amazing, the like Megan the stallion, um, my inspiration. Of course. (laughs) Yes. Um, and then I'm also the curvy Afro vegan for vegan knobs. I do try to keep my vegan identity, uh, muted and stuff. (laughs) So I appreciate that. Like whenever I go on dates, people are like, I didn't realize you're a vegan. I'm like, that's kind of like the appeal is like, I'm like a sexy secret vegan. Yes. Um, so, <laughs> so, sexy secret vegan. That's the I other have, shirt from this episode. I know. Where is my secret from? Uh, but yeah, that's where I am. And I'm super friendly, super open, super chill. So if people want to reach out about anything big or small, I'm like so, so happy to be supportive to anyone doing anything adventurous. Wonderful. Well, thank you again. And um, we'll be in touch soon. (laughs) Sounds good. Thanks, y'all. Thank you. This is an All Bodies on Bikes podcast powered by Feisty Media. The show is produced by Maggie and Marley and edited by the team at Feisty Media. Thanks for listening. (laughs) 